hey business, there's a risk over here. Finance, what do you think about this? Science people, what do you do? Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, contracts and legal ops professional Jennifer Ogren tears down Iridium Satellite's contract for launch services. Now, I could make a bunch of jokes about this contract being out of this world, but I won't, because there are some serious red flags in this thing. So, let's tear it down. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. I'm Mike Whalen. The purpose in this show is exactly what it sounds like. We take contracts, we beat them up, we are mean. We are generally mean, occasionally nice. Uh, and today, we've got sort of a cool one. I hang out with uh, smart friends, as you know, uh, like uh, Jennifer Ogren here. Jennifer, how are you today? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Cool. So we're doing something. We're doing something weird and cool and fun and we are going to space and i will try not to make non-stop star wars jokes uh but we are looking at a document i'll share it with you guys here it is the contract for launch services uh as between iridium satellite and space exploration technologies corp so we are we are legit talking about going to space in contracts you know like all the universes combining and colliding so jennifer what is this document uh when are we going to see this kind of thing Anytime you want to go to space, you're going to have a contract that's between you as a space person. You have a spacecraft, you have something, you want to get space. And somehow you've got to get a ride for that. So you're going to go on a launch provider. You're going to select a launch provider. So in this case, Iridium had a satellite or multiple satellites they wanted to put up into space to do something cool for the consumers. And they needed a ride to get there and SpaceX has given them the ride there. Very cool. So we're going to talk about that, but I'm also sort of twisty on your background. Tell me about your background because it's super interesting for the conversation we're about to have. Right. So I came out of school as a programmer, a nerd, bits and zeros, and somehow I've moved into the legal world. So while I'm not an attorney, I cannot give licensed attorney advice. I work for fabulous attorneys in my organization, and I do a more different generalized set when I get a contract. So I'm their senior contracts manager. I take it. I shred the contract myself, much like you do on your show. And then I get all the points out to the relevant stakeholders in my organization. So, hey, business, there's a risk over here. Finance, what do you think about this? science people, what do you do? Um, it, does this concern you that SpaceX has done this or that the launch provider has done that over there? And I get to consolidate all that feedback. So we go in with a fully shredded document back to our other partner. Yeah, and it's so interesting because in 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 reality, in the wild, uh, there's a big conversation in legal right now, uh, in in-house teams about legal operations, about trying to you know turn the legal department into a business unit that works like a business. And one of the things that they they often do in these scenarios is find ways to leverage staff and tools that didn't go out and get a JD and borrow hundreds of thousands of dollars, but can add a ton of value to these environments. So part of what I want to do with you, Jennifer, as we go through this is think about the way that you think, the way you're looking through these uh, documents, not necessarily as the first filter, but as one of the early filters to go through and do the issue spotting uh, that is so common in legal training. So we're going to do that. Um, we're going to start right up at the beginning. I've got a list of issues that you think about when you go into a document like this. I'm gonna lead you through them and feel free to uh, just tell us how you think about these particular sections. Let's start with the schedule and the rides. This is in section five. Tell us about that section. Right. So whenever you're getting ready, you're getting super excited about space. You guys have probably a spacecraft. They're in the lab, they're tinkering, they're building, they put piece parts together. But the first thing you've got to know whenever you're setting up for a launch service is when am I going to be ready? Do I know when that thing in the lab is going to come out of the lab? And oftentimes you don't. You're going to come up with different challenges. Things are going to happen. Things are going to change. That piece part's not available. Oh, all of a sudden there's a supply chain disruption. Do you have buffer in your schedule? Have you talked to the program schedulers to know what the margin is and where you're thinking something's gonna come out? Because the minute that you sign up for that launch provider agreement, they're gonna pick a launch window. They're gonna pick a launch period, a launch schedule. It's gonna keep getting refined down and down until you actually have a launch day. But you've gotta know what that big window is. Is it a three month window? Is it a six month window? So when you're reading that launch provider contract, you really wanna make sure to know where you're gonna be and where you're gonna land because you wanna pick the right ride that you wanna go on. 
So I think one tip is to always be on time. But if you're not going to be on time, have you read the rest of the contract to see what happens? Are you going to get delay fees? Are you going to be penalized? Are you going to be terminated? Are you going to be taken off the right? You got to know what happened. So that's the first question I ask myself. What's going to happen if I'm late? And I think everybody should know that as well. Right. And pulling from that, I mean, it, it, you know, the the information about the delays comes from 22 and 2.5. So you you've done that initial thing where you've seen this being a problem enough that you as the you know, one of the principal reviewers of this document are asking those questions. What are you seeing in 22 and 2.5 that answer that question for you? Yeah, so Article 22 is going to be about force majeure, and this fits in with your launch provider's manifest policy. So the launch provider, you're not their only customer. I mean, you want to be, but newsflash, they actually have a business to run. So you can make a good Star Wars joke there. They've got to have um, uh, an empire? Jabba. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, an empire. Yeah. Galactic? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Something like that. So when they think about the manifest policy, they've got these set of documents on where your spot is and how they rush and roulette move you around if something happens. So in Article 22, you're looking at force majeure and you're really making sure that you understand what's called out in force majeure. Something that I see frequently is that it's a launch or a rocket delay is considered force majeure. That's not standard for most people. You're like, oh, pandemics, illnesses, war, act of God, all these good things. And all of a sudden it sneaks in here that you've got a manifest policy and the manifest policy is, oh, sorry, we couldn't get liquid oxygen in time. You're delayed. That's a force majeure. So you're not going to get your money back. What are you going to do? Other parts that I think that you could look in in section 2.5 is if your launch provider would change the launch site on you. So most people say, well, we couldn't get you to Florida. Now let's launch maybe out of California or Alaska, or we'll go look to a different facility you've got to be able to know when you have to deliver your spacecraft. And so to me, that brings in my logistics people. I'm going to start querying them. If I have to get my spacecraft from here to there, do I need a license? Do I need some permits? Do I have Department of Transportation hazardous issues? Is there batteries? Are there things that I have to pack in in certain parts where if I were going to California, I wouldn't worry about. If I were going to Florida, maybe, or vice versa. So I think you have to be very careful about understanding if you get delayed what Pandora's box opens up, changes to your launch site, changes to your schedule. What happens if your science mission, you're banking on it to go get your fundraise, and all of a sudden you're delayed? Can you go back to the market? Can you get another CJA? So I'm also talking to my financial folks and maybe my CFO to say, we're not banking on this ride to go get millions from investors, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it, you know, we've talked about force majeure, obviously, over this last year. And oftentimes there's the question of, can we just rely on common law force majeure? Like, do we even need to say anything in the document? But in this kind of document, I mean, you really are the wind blows westerly and you've got millions of dollars at stake. It's fascinating. Well, thinking about things that might be out of the control and making decisions about what to do if you've got to end the flight. What do you see in 17 on termination? So Section 17 is... I think it's a mover and a shaker in the launch industry. I've been in the industry for about eight years now, and I've seen different things happen. I've seen from where we've gone from more of a government-based launch to the commercial sectors really exploding. And that's thanks to the government. They've really promoted this thought of let's go to space. Let's make it accessible for everybody. So termination starts to get weird, and it's going to be probably dependent on launch provider you're working with. There's different things in different ways. Whereas in the past, I may have seen a liquidated damage that I would have flagged for my legal team um, and knowing when to be late. I'm actually starting to see that it's just delay rights or termination rights. It's not actually going after each other for a fee. It's not about money anymore. It's more about getting to space. Hmm. So I guess from my side, I'm looking at two different points. I'm looking for the termination for convenience. If for some reason the wild ride is just too much and I need to move to a different launch provider, do I have a way to get out? And if I do, what what am I paying or what can I refund or what does everybody keep? So in that part, I'm talking to my science team for what happens if we needed to go procure something else. I'm also talking to the finance side to say, I've paid all this money. What's the return on investment? What are we out? What's the risk you're willing to take? And then I'm talking to my legal team of what are the notice provisions that you guys will take? Can you do 30 days, 60 day, 90 day? What are your notices that are going in there? But I've probably already made payments. Um, 
I've looked at schedule. So I don't think that there's one right approach. I think everyone's going to customize what termination rights are right for them. Of course, you've got the normal termination for material defaults. Things don't happen well. Parties, should I say, blow up at each other? Dare I say? <laughs> Things go wrong. And so you do want that material default provision in there. Yeah, speaking of people going at crossways with each other, uh, looking at 12.1, the cross waivers, there's a lot of people with feelings. You know, how do you manage that? What What is 12.1 showing you? 12.1 has to be the weirdest provision if you're new to the launch industry. So if you're a lawyer and you get a launch services agreement and you start at 12.1 with the cross waivers, like, heck no, I'm not signing up for this. This is terrible for me. Why on God's green earth would you sign up for this? And I would say, well, you have to because it's regulation. The FAA publishes the cross waivers that are in the Code of Federal Regulations. And so it is required when that launch provider gets their launch license that they make everybody sign a cross waiver, meaning nobody can have a suing party. So the government's telling us all that space is really hard. And there would be no commercial space providers if everyone just started suing each other, putting each other out of business, right? Right, right. So the cross waivers is the government's way to step in and say, hey, guys, play nice with each other. You're all going to waive. Once that launch license starts, you're all going to waive the claims against each other. So sorry if the launch doesn't go well, if it um, terminates on the the pad itself or uh, what we call in the rocket industry a RUD, a rapid unscheduled disassembly somehow in space it just terminates or for the safety they've terminated something i think you've seen that with a couple failed launches regularly um lately and so there is no sewing party you each go your own ways and say sorry space is hard so what i bring into here and um usually with my legal team there's not a lot you can customize here but it's something that you want to flag so that your parent companies or entities are saying well, wait a second, why did you just wave? Why didn't you go after them with full force? I said, I can't, it's the law, it's regulation. So we wanna make sure that we keep the private sector and the innovations going on within the space industry. And so that's why I bring it up here. It, it yeah. directly impacts what you sign. I mean, and yet uh, you, there's an indemnification section uh, in 14. What's the relationship between, hey, we're just gonna all work together and deal and the indemnification section in a document like this? So there's going to, there might actually be two indemnification sections. And this is what I'll flag for my legal team immediately. I'll say there should be an indemnification provision for the cross waiver itself, because again, that's pulling from the waivers, but you're also going to see perhaps an indemnification section on things that happen for third party claims that happen because of the performance or arising out of the performance of the contract itself. So let's take the pieces apart here and go more about the indemnification on the cross waivers. Not much you can do. You're going to indemnify each other. The government's going to indemnify you. And then you're going to push all that indemnifications down to people that are riding along into space with you. On the contract side, though, what I'm flagging and what I'm looking out for are third party claims that might come from infringement. If the launch provider has given me a spec of their launch pro- their launch vehicle itself and I've used it and somebody comes and sues me because of I use that spec, mm. I want coverage there. But normally when my um, legal team is is negotiating on the contracts themselves, they're looking for that indemnification for the third party claim. Hmm. Uh, speaking of everybody sharing all kinds of really expensive IP, what about licensing? Uh, take me back to 12. What do you see in that section? Yeah, 12 is going to be in multiple places. So it'll be not only on IP licenses. So you have the ability to use that spec that we talked about from mm. the launch provider. But you've also, now that you have your spacecraft, you have licensing with other government agencies as well. So your spacecraft probably beeps and boops up there once it's in that black void. And those beeps and boops are very well regulated. So Mm -hmm. you may have some licensing terms. You may be going in front of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. You may be going in front of the Federal Aviation Administration, um, the NOAA, who when you're taking pictures of the Earth, NOAA is actually regulating. So you may have different licenses that sit to or talk to how your spacecraft works. And of course, this is when I'm talking about a United States based launcher. So the people that I'm working with in the, not just the legal team on licensing, I'm actually working with people that might be radio frequency engineers. My engineering team's telling me how it beeps or how it boops, what sort of bands that it's talking about and what it's doing. And the launch vehicle too. Launch vehicle has antennas. You've all seen SpaceX launching, got all those pretty pictures. Well, they had to be licensed by the right regulations to beam those pictures down to us and stream it to us. 
The other thing I want to talk about a little bit is you'll have licensing potentially on export control. That's a big part of our industry. So if you haven't been in the launch world for a little while, rockets or missiles, um, they're on the United States munitions list. Pretty obvious there. And so information or data about them can be export controlled. So there may be licenses if you're a customer that might be in Europe or you might be in a different place. For the launch provider to talk to you, you may have to get some sort of export licenses in place. Now, of course, there are not only that munitions list, but you can also think about the um, export administrator administration regulations, the year where some things are somewhat controlled, but there might be some carve outs just depending on how our government has gone through and classified them. Mm. Uh, and finally, before we get to the big picture about how you guys are processing uh, contracts, which I find fascinating, uh, tell me about 15, the risk of a loss, the insurance section. What are you seeing there? This is really the hardest section as a legal professional to actually take on and read because much like you did the cross waiver above where you said nobody gets to sue each other, you have to take a hard gulp and say, I can't go after anything. I am taking the full risk of loss. Hmm. The things I do flag, you probably won't have much success in negotiating on, but what I will tell my legal team is there are parts in here on risk of loss of when does it happen? So we go through some hypotheticals. If you're delivered your spacecraft to a launch processing facility, they pick it up off their dock and then, you know, they put it on a crane and they get it ready and they get it mounted and they're going to get ready to put it on that launch vehicle and something happens. Is that your risk of loss or is that theirs? Right. It's a gray area. Now, of course, the cross waiver and the launch license is going to step in and say, were you doing pre-hazardous activities um, that were associated with the launch? OK, maybe. Yeah. But maybe they weren't either. So it's going to be really, really hard to say, is it a risk of loss we're willing to take or do we just want to go to space so bad that that's going to be the way it is? So yeah. you probably won't win the battle. Yeah. And it's so interesting because like thinking of the big picture and stepping back a little bit, What's interesting to me about this operations environment that you're in is maybe there's some argument, objective argument that a lawyer wants to make about all these risks and doing a bunch of issue spotting. It, it, what's interesting about the layer of having someone with your background, which is a mix of the legal and you know feed in the business, is that you're looking at all those things through the prism of what's the business trying to accomplish? What are we trying to do? And I'm just sort of fascinated in the way that that you're looking at these documents that might be different from the way that the lawyer is doing it, especially with the way that you're dealing with all the stakeholders inside the business to sort of pre-make some of the decisions before it goes through what someone might call a strictly legal analysis. So talk, talk a bit about that, about how you fit in into the machine of your company contracting and what kind of impact that you're having on some of those decisions that are being made that the lawyers will end up grappling with when you know they start going back and forth with documents. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe I'll give you an example for insurance here. So let's pick an insurance provision. Um, if you want to do pre-launch insurance, if you want to have during the launch insurance, or you want on-orbit insurance, that's a very custom product to what your organization takes as a level of risk. So inside my organization, I get to be, I would say, the chief collaborator. I get to bring everyone together for discussion. And I usually will put to, together a summary. Here's the highlight here's the summary, here's the risk, here's the probability, here's the mitigation. What are we as a company willing to do? What fits with our values? And does this make sense in what we're trying to do? Or is this a no-go? Every once in a while, you'll find something that's just an absolute no-go and say, great, that's the part we need to negotiate together. Let's pick a legal position, let's pick a business position, and let's have a backup plan. So I actually get to bring everyone together, take the first whack, and then I'm going to say, what do you guys think? Do you think we should try over here? Or do you think we should try here? And I get to be the solution maker that works with the legal team. So I work out of the business operations organization. Mm. I don't report to the lawyer team. I'm dotted line to my general counsel, but the phone is always, always open. She's a phenomenal person that I work with. 
Huh, it's so interesting. Well, I, I, you know, for l- lots of reasons, uh, which you and I have talked about separately, I'm, I'm really interested in this, you know, how contracting happens and the, the, the distance that's between that initial draft and the final draft and how in the middle, it's lots of people making lots of decisions collaboratively, really interesting uh, environment. I would also point out, I think that during this conversation, we identified launch companies as the evil empire, which would make Elon Musk <laughs> Vader, which is funny because I think he might be too eccentric for anybody to take him seriously as a Vader character, which I just find fascinating. Anyway, uh, thank you, Jennifer, uh, for the insights. For people who want to reach out to you and learn more about this context and the operations side, how you guys are managing contracts, uh, what's the best way to connect with you? Find me on LinkedIn. I am called the Legal Systems Whisperer. Um, so Jennifer Ogren, O-G-R-E-N, or um, you can also find me most of the time working in the consortium for legal operations. It's called Clock. It's another organization, or I'm sure they can contact you, sure. um, Mike, and, and you'll pass my information along. Absolutely. We'll make sure to have that information in the blog post for this episode over at lawinsider.com slash resources. And if any of you want to be on the show and beat up contracts and be mean and accuse, you know, uh, rich people of being evil emperors, uh, uh, th- all you have to do is email us. We are at community at lawinsider.com. We will connect with that. Uh, thank you again, Jennifer. You guys have a great day and we will see you next time on the Contract Teardown Show. Thanks. Thanks.